All right, Mother's Day, huh? Not many things more important than moms and mothers. Uh, moms, I, I want you to kind of think about this, okay? Think about um, all those practices that you drove kids to, the emergency room visits, um, all the money that you've spent, all the diapers that you changed. So this is your day to grab your child or your children and look them in the eye and say, you owe me. <laughs> and rightly so, man. Just you soak that up because we owe you. We sure do. So my wife, Tammy, uh, we, when we had our firstborn, uh, her water broke at about midnight. We'd just gone to bed, no sleep. And uh, so we got up, went to the hospital, up all night, all the next day, 19 and a half hours in delivery, and Ryan was born at 8.30 p.m. the next night. And man, I didn't think I was going to make it. It was a tough night on me. It was really difficult. It was so bad. But it was really tough on her, and uh, a, lot, a lot of respect that I have for my wife, thankful for the mom that we have. So I want to talk to you today. We're going to kind of merge concepts today. We've been in this message series about launching on mission, being on mission as a church and being on mission as individual believers. And what I want to talk to you about is not only our church being on mission, but moms, you being on mission also, and how important it is for you to keep the main thing, the main thing, for us as a church to keep the main thing, the main thing. That you as an individual believer keep the main thing, the main thing. And believe it or not, that question is answered for all of us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Let's read it together. Here's what it says. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we're in week three now of this little series through what has been called the Great Commission. This is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. It is clear to make disciples... It is the job of the church to make disciples. Again, saying this is, how, this is why God has left us on this earth. It is our job to go and impact people with the gospel of Christ, to know Christ, to love him, and to make him known to other people. It is the job of every believer. It is that job. And believe it or not, parents, this is your primary job. This is your primary job. Your job is to develop your child to know Christ and to love God and to make him known to other people. And moms, your role, of course, is vitally important in that mission. It is critical. But life pushes up against that kind of clarity and that kind of effectiveness, doesn't it? Now, I want to share with you how life pushes back against that kind of mission. And here's what I'm calling Mike's Irrefutable Laws Opposing the Establishment of Proper Priorities and Effective Living. These are irrefutable laws that push against us achieving this mission. Here's law number one, the law of perpetual projects. <laughs> perpetual projects. Here's, here's the phrase out beside that. There's always something else to do. Isn't that true? This is life in the 21st century. I was out doing some work yesterday in the backyard, and I thought to myself, I've got so many things to do. And you get to the point, you just get overwhelmed. You just want to sit down and do none of them. You just feel like things are overwhelming. This is the way life is, again, in the 21st century. I mean, your to-do list is a list of to-do lists. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Always something else to do. Busyness is the idea. But it goes beyond busyness. There's another law here. It's called the law of competing choices. And here, here's the subtlety that I want to share with you today, the complexity that often accompanies life. See, life is about value exchanges. And there are competing choices in life that we have to deal with. And it creates this complexity where it's not always a choice between something good and something bad. That would be an easy choice. But often our choices are between something good and something else that's good. And so we're always having to figure out, okay, if I do this, then what's the impact of doing that as compared to doing this? And those competing choices creates this complexity about what to do. We, we, there, you know, there's so many good things. And so we, don't have a lack, we have a lack of clarity with respect to those things that are most important, which really leads to the last thing, the law of the squeaky wheel. 
We live with this every day. That which is urgent gets my attention. That which is urgent gets my attention. Here's the problem with that. Just because something is urgent does not mean it's important. And so we can live our lives in such a way where we're doing that which is urgent and we're getting those things done every day. We reach the end of the day and there's a sense of a lack of fulfillment. You say, well, I've got a lot of things done, but did I really achieve anything? I'm like the, the hamster on the wheel. I'm going 100 miles an hour, but did I really go anywhere? You see, activity doesn't necessarily equate to productivity. Busyness doesn't always equate to effectiveness. It's not just enough to do some things. It's doing the right things, doing the important things, not just the urgent. So those laws kind of work against us. And in light of those laws, we have this clear command of Jesus that we are to go and make disciples. It is unambiguous. Go and make disciples. It's the job of the church, the job of every believer, the job of every parent. Moms, your role is vital in it. It's your job. So let's define what it is to make a disciple. We can talk about it all we want. If we don't understand what it is, we'll never hit it. Years ago, we made this clear choice that we were going to turn this ship to focus on making disciples, that it was not our primary concern. Our primary goal was not to build the largest church in Northwest Houston. Our primary goal was to make disciples, not just get people to show up, but to grow up. And so we said, okay, well, let's first define what a disciple is. If we're going to grow them, let's define what they are. Here's what it is. Here's how we've defined it. An authentic disciple of Jesus is one who's discovering God's presence and power for living, connecting to others in Christian community, growing in faith and love as a follower of Christ, and experiencing the joy of serving others. That's our spiritual growth path. Discover, connect, grow, serve. We say if you really want to reach your potential in Christ, you want to grow as a follower of Christ, you must first of all discover the power and presence of God in your life either by beginning a relationship with him or experiencing dynamic worship where we give our our lives fully and freely to him, discovering God's presence and power, connecting in authentic Christian relationships. It's important that we build Christian relationships in order to grow spiritually. Growing in our faith and love as a follower of Christ. Growing deeper beyond Sunday mornings. Growing deeper in our love for, for God, for his word. And then serving experiencing the true joy of what it means to selflessly serve other people. This is what it means to be a disciple, and this is a lifelong pursuit. We never arrive. We never fully check it off. We are always about doing it. That's what it is. But let's look at what it is not, all right? Because by defining what it is, we're able to really understand then what it's not, what is our business, what is none of our business, what we should do, what we should not do. Because life is about these choices. And if we're going to achieve one thing effectively, it means we must choose not to do other things. Put those things aside. Even though they may be good, it's not best. Even though they may be urgent, it's not most important. So what it's not, as a church, let me remind us that our primary concern under God is not to build good church attenders. Understand there's a difference between a good church attender and a authentic disciple of Jesus. It's not our job primarily to even build committed church members. It is our job primarily to build authentic disciples of Jesus. Moms, let me remind you, moms, that your primary concern under God is not to have a child who has a great GPA. It's not to have a child who is a great athlete. It's not to have a child who grows up to get a college scholarship or who becomes the most popular person in the school. That's not your primary job, your primary concern. Your primary concern is that you would grow up and develop and influence this little person in your life to the degree that they would become an authentic disciple of Jesus. That's your primary mission. It's true for each and every one of us. Here's the irony, moms. Parents, here's the irony. When you, when you settle that, when you make that the, the clarifying mission of your life, everything else tends to line up. 
when that is first, kids find the ability to reach their potential in all these other areas. They find the ability and the freedom and the empowerment and the resources internally by which to become that great student or that great athlete if they're ever going to. But it's a matter of first things first. Putting Christ first. Jesus said it clearly, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Everything lines up behind that core mission. That's what it is. That's what it's not. Let me share with you now, though, what it takes. And we don't have to look any further than this premier verse in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is called the Shema. This is the pinnacle of God's teaching in the Old Testament. The Old Testament could be summarized by this. Now, I'm not sure how they missed this. How the law and how all these rules and regulations became so preeminent. But here it is, central to the teaching of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So what is, what is the command here? It is to love God fully. Love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And that these teachings, these words would be on your heart. And then beyond that, you would teach them to your children. Diligently is the, is the word here. Diligently teach them to your children and talk about them. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and people read that last part and they often think, well, the Bible is talking about me kind of spiritually force-feeding my kids where I have four Bible studies every day with them and an hour prayer time and that kind of thing, just force-feeding our kids spiritually. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's not what the Bible is teaching. The Bible is saying as you do life, a very natural and organic part of your life is is your relationship to God and your love for God. It's woven into the fabric of your being to the degree that it would pour out as you do life. As you sit, as you walk, as you lie down, as you rise up, your faith is there. So, when you read this verse, it just shouts from the rooftop, what is this week's On Mission Attitude? We've been listing for you an On Mission Attitude every week, okay? Every week we've been looking at an On Mission Attitude, asking you to assimilate this attitude into your heart, into your life. This week's On Mission Attitude is laser focus. Laser focus. Putting first things first. Keeping the main thing the main thing. Here's what that means. Putting the priority of being an authentic disciple first in my life. Putting that first in my life. Look on the back of your message outline. Let's look at these on-mission attitudes again. I want to repeat these to you every week so we can really grasp them. I'm going to read them. Embrace uncertainty. Accepting any divine appointments that God has for us in life. No one left behind. A commitment to find a way to meet someone's need when we discover it. I hope this past week, that's what we looked at last week was that one. I hope this past week you were able to discover someone's need and meet it. Somebody told me a story in between the services where she had just prayed and God dropped one of those in her lap. She met that need. Next, laser focus. That's what we're discussing today, putting the priority of being an authentic disciple first in my life. Choose to belong. When the Christian life becomes inconvenient, I must choose to belong to the process of spiritual growth. Not check out of it, but stick, stay. Not give up on my relationship to God. To engage the opportunities God provides for ministry and to remain loyal to my spiritual family, the church. And then the last one here is no one alone. No one alone. If we see someone alone and excluded, this is automatically God's invitation to reach out to them. John Banta told me a story about two or three of the kids that are in our preteen ministry. He came back and he said, so tell us your God stories. Tell us about any of these on-mission attitudes. Were you able to do any of these? What about no one alone? And two or three of the kids, one of them in particular, a little girl said, yeah, there was this, there's this other girl that sits by herself at lunch and I went over and sat with her and I'm sitting with her all week long. 
I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's a life on mission. So, unpacking laser focus. What does that mean? What does that look like? What are the characteristics of that in order for us to go out of here actually doing it? Three things, I think. Number one, perspective. Perspective. It's where we ask and answer this big question of our lives, what will be the center of my life? What will be the center of my life? And Deuteronomy 6 answers that clearly. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write the word idolatry. Idolatry. Out on your message outline. Idolatry. And then I want you to write just in front of that word a big K. And what do you have? Kidolatry. Kidolatry. I think we have a lot of parents that are practicing kidolatry. Idolatry being extreme love or worship of something that's in the place of God. I think there are many parents who are worshiping at the altar of their children. Every decision they make revolves around their kids. Their, their kids are the center of their lives and in their minds the center of the universe. And they are elevating their children to a place of preeminence that they were never made for. And it actually creates very unhealthy kinds of families, very dysfunctional kinds of families. When you put your kids first in your life, when you make them your first priority, when they are before God, they are even moms before your husband, that obsession ends up hurting your children, not helping them. Research has borne this out to be true. I read an article this week about moms whose lives revolve around children and how those lives and moms actually suffer because of doing so. It's a psychology article. And the phrase is intensive parenting. That's the phrase they're using now, intensive parenting. Here's what it says. Moms who take an intensive approach marked by the belief that parents should always put their child's needs first are less likely to be satisfied with their lives and more likely to be stressed than other moms. Intensive parenting, they say, is a style with two main philosophies. Listen to this. Number one, that mothering should always center around the child's needs. And number two, that children are the most fulfilling dimension of life. This is going to sound countercultural, but what I want to say to you is that if you've embraced those notions, that mothering is primarily about and centered around every one of your child's needs getting met, and that children are the most fulfilling dimension of life, you are setting yourself up for great, great unfulfillment. Because those things are just not true, and life does not work around those myths. He talks about how these parents are more stressed and more depressed. And their children, listen to this, their children end up having more difficulties adjusting to life's challenges. Because again, they're elevated to a place that they were never designed for. Children are not the center of the universe. Children are not to be a substitute and a replacement for your love for God. It's just not that way. It should not be that way. Of course kids are important. I don't need to say that. They're very important. But when they become the center of your life, of which everything else revolves, they become something they were never intended to be. And you're worshiping at the altar of your kids. And that bond that connects a parent and a child, instead of a bond, becomes a leash. And that passion that you have for parenting becomes an obsession And it becomes very, very unhealthy. And we think, we say it's because the child needs us. Oh, the child needs us. But let's talk about who really needs who in that relationship. Is it really the child that needs you? Or is it you that need that child in that way? And if that child is meeting needs in you that God should ultimately meet, you're practicing kidolatry. And you're setting yourself up for great disappointment. Kids grow up, they leave the house, and there's a void. 
And that void was intended to be filled with God. You say, well, how can you tell? How, how can I tell that I'm placing my kids above God? Well, look at the decisions that you make. This is where we live in life. Look at the trade-offs, okay? What do you put above God? Do you put their activities above God? Their friendships above God? Their academics? Their commitments? What about even their hardships and their challenges? You see yourself as being the great savior who comes in and rescues your children every time they have a difficult thing happen in their life. Rescuing them from the very adversities that God is going to use in some way to develop them and their character into Christ's likeness. You've gone through challenges. I've gone through challenges. Those challenges in our lives, those hardships, has created something good in us because we've learned how to respond to those challenges. And yet, we preempt our children of the very things that made us into the people that we are by rescuing them from every challenge that they face in their lives. Elevating them to a place they were never intended to be. Joshua, the great leader of the nation of Israel who succeeded Moses, they had just conquered and entered into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 24, he stands in front of the whole nation of Israel. They had gone from daily manna, survival mode, into now a land flowing with milk and honey. There was, there was going to be a time of abundance and prosperity like the nation had never known. And Joshua stood before them and he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether it be the God of the Amorites, the Hittites, or this God, that God, choose you this day whom you will serve. And then he said, as for me... And my house, we will serve the Lord. A clear decision that every parent must make. Perspective, the way of seeing life, a perspective about what is most important. Secondly, conviction. The question that we ask and answer there is, what will be the passion of my heart? What will be the passion of my heart? Because what is the passion of your heart gets passed down to your children? These values are not taught so much as they're caught. You want to teach your kids to love God. Well, you must love God yourself. So what do you spend your time talking about? What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your energy toward? What are the passions of your heart? What are your discussions around the table? What are your conversations with your kid? What are your interests? What are you authentically excited about? Those passions will be passed down. You cannot give to your children what you do not possess yourself. And the third thing, as far as being laser focused, is diligence. Diligence. To what will I give my best effort? To what will I give my best effort? Will it be toward this thing of spiritually impacting our children? I think we're giving a lot of best efforts in our world. And moms, uh, I'm certain, I have no doubt that each and every one of you are giving your best effort toward being a good mom. But maybe, maybe, We just need to redefine what being a good mom is or what it means. Because you're giving your best effort to a lot of things, but are you giving your best effort to the main thing? Your child's academics, essential, non-negotiable. Child's hygiene, (laughs) Essential, hopefully non-negotiable. Friendships, you want your best effort. Your best effort in all these areas. What about God? Leftovers? God's optional. Church? That's optional. Something better to do on a Sunday? That's optional. Parents ask me all the time, should I make my kids go to church? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Do you make them go to school? Yes. You lead your children. And you do so with vision and with example. And they will follow. 
and their attitudes will catch up to their actions. But you don't rob them of the right thing to do because they don't feel like it, or you don't feel like it. You do the right thing. That's what being a parent is all about. So what are you giving your best effort to? Which ties directly into this week's On Mission action, okay? So we've talked about an attitude and action, an attitude and action every week. Here's our On Mission action for this week, a spiritual conversation. A spiritual conversation. We're going to move the needle now from just kind of saying hi, just from building a good relationship with them, just from prayer to now moving the needle to have some kind of spiritual conversation. Let's apply this first to mom since this is Mother's Day. Think about what kind of spiritual impact you can have with your child and what would that look like in a practical way, even this week. Let me give you some options. The first thing is maybe for you to affirm them in some way. Affirm them in some way. That might be the best kind of spiritual thing that you could do to them because we fall in this trap and this routine, don't we? It's, it's what they're not doing, what they should be doing. And don't do this and don't do that and do this and do that and don't bend your brother that way and don't slap your sister and get off of that. And, you know, all those, and that's the routine. And we end up focusing on what we don't have rather than what we do have and what they lack rather than who they are. And maybe the best thing that you could do spiritually for your child this week is to look them in the eye and tell them something great about how God made them and to mean it. And to focus on that. Let them feel love from you through your affirming words. Maybe you need to apologize and ask for forgiveness. That might reveal God to them in some amazing way. They might see God in you through that. You know, when parents are always right, when parents always defend their actions, when parents react to the person instead of responding to God, kids don't learn that faith is about forgiveness and grace. Forgiveness truly makes sense when we begin to realize how deeply we need God to forgive us. And so when we do that, then they learn to own responsibility for their mistakes. How are they going to learn it if they don't see it in us? And at times we need to go to our children and ask them to forgive us. Maybe, just maybe, it's neither one of those. You need to confront them. Maybe in your life it's been easier for you to to do nothing rather than point your home, point your kids and your family toward God. It's been easier to let it drift and the pattern is so established now that you'd have to interrupt the pattern and you'd have to have serious conversations with them in order to turn the ship a little bit more toward God. Well, maybe you need to do that. You need to confront them. You need to say, you know what? We're going to turn things in our home and we're going to make things point more toward God now. And I'm not going to do that perfectly and I'm not a saint, but we're going to pursue our love for Christ more in our home than what we've done before. And it's going to take some courage on your part and it's going to mean some disruptions to your family because they may maybe like things as they are. They like the status quo, but you're there to lead them and to guide them and to help them become what God wants your family to be. Maybe it's, maybe it's to pray with them. I run into many, many parents who are intimidated about praying with their kids particularly their kids that are teenage or older. The power of a parent praying with their child. To sit with your child and to pray with them. What does that say to that child? To pray with them and to pray for them. We dropped off my middle son at the airport on Thursday. He left Thursday morning to go and work at a Christian camp all summer. He's going to be gone for three months, and we hate it that he's going to be gone um, so long. But we're proud of him, you know? It's one of those things. But there in the airport, we made a circle. People going all around us made a circle as a family. And my oldest son prayed for his younger brother. He just said, it just doesn't get any better than that. 
We're not ashamed of our love for each other. We're not ashamed of our love for Christ. Praying with your kids. Abraham Lincoln talks about his mother's prayers for him. He says, um, I remember my mother's prayers and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. Isn't that beautiful? A mom's prayer over her kids. So mothers, um, re-up, refocus. Determine in your heart that as for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. Now beyond moms, we all get to apply this on mission action. Okay, so in our workplace, we're going to move the needle. We're going to have a spiritual conversation. It may mean inviting somebody to church this week. It may mean sharing part of your faith story with someone. It may mean offering to pray for someone. But you're going to have a spiritual conversation. We're going to have a spiritual conversation with these people that might be outside of faith this week. And God's going to encourage us and give us the strength to do so. In your neighborhood, in your workplace, maybe a friendship with someone who is outside of faith in Christ. Laser focus, all right? May we as a church never, ever forget what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're in this to make disciples, people who authentically love God and who make Him known to other people, parents, moms. That's why you're here. That's why that child was given to you so that they would grow up to know and love Christ and to make him known to others. So think about those three parts of laser focus, right? We've got, um, uh, what do we have? (laughs) Perspective. We have perspective. We have conviction. We have diligence. And I think everything kind of hinges on perspective, right? If we get our perspective correct, then everything else follows. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this special day for moms. And I thank you for those mothers in this room who are doing exactly what I've described today. They are doing the heavy lifting, God. They are staying faithful to you. They are staying faithful to teach and inspire their kids. They are doing the good work and the godly work. And I pray that today they would feel your smile upon them and your encouragement for them to keep running this race, knowing that it's worth it. And Lord, I pray that in every way you would help us to keep the main thing the main thing. I pray that in every way we would not drift, you would remind us and that each and every one of these moms in the room, each and every believer in this room, our church as a whole, would be intent to stay laser focused on making disciples. We thank you for the calling and we thank you for the strength to fulfill it. We pray these things in Jesus' name.